Hello everyone, now let us discuss about the anatomy of eye. Before that, we will discuss what are electromagnetic radiations. Electromagnetic radiation is an energy in the form of waves that radiates from the sun. And there are many types of electromagnetic radiation including gamma rays, x-rays, uv rays, visible light, IR radiation, microwaves and radio waves. This range of electromagnetic radiation is also known as electromagnetic spectrum. And the distance between two consecutive peaks of an electromagnetic wave is the wavelength. The distance between two consecutive peaks of an electromagnetic wave is the wavelength. And the wavelength ranges from short to long. For example, gamma rays have wavelength smaller than nanometers. And most radio waves have wavelength greater than a meter. And the eyes are responsible. The eyes are responsible for the detection of visible light. Hence the term visible light. The part of the electromagnetic spectrum with wavelengths ranging from 400 to 700 nanometers. And visible light exhibit colors. The color of visible light depends upon its wavelength. For example, the light that has a wavelength of 400 nanometers is violet and the light that has a wavelength of 700 nanometers is red. An object can absorb certain wavelengths of visible light and reflect others. And the object will appear the color of the wavelength that it reflected. This is important point. The object will appear the color of the wavelength that it reflected. For example, a green apple appears green because it reflects mostly green light and absorbs most other wavelengths of visible light. An object appears white because it reflects all wavelengths of visible light. And an ob object appears black because it absorbs all wavelengths of visible light. Here you can see the magnetic spectrum. It will be from energy to energy. Gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet rays, infrared rays, microwave and radio waves. Between the ultraviolet and infrared are the visible light. This is the visible light range. In terms of nanometers, it ranges from 400 to 700 nanometers. The visible light ranges from 400 to nanometers. And above is the energy points of the respective rays. Now coming to the accessory structures of eye. The accessory structures of eye are eyelids, eyelashes, eyebrows, lacrimal apparatus and finally extrinsic eye muscle. These are the accessory structures of eye. Here you can see the schematic representation. This is eyelid, this is pupa, the white matter is sclera and this is iris. Here you can see the schematic representation of various parts of the accessory structures of eye. And in this current session, we will be discussing about each accessory structures and their respective functions. First of all, coming to eyelids. This thing is the eyelid. The upper and lower eyelids or palpebrae. The another term for eyelid is Palpebrae. The upper and lower eyelids or palpebrae shade the eyes during sleep, protect the eyes from excessive light and foreign objects, and spread lubricating secretions over the eyeballs. The upper eyelid is more movable than the lower eyelid and contains in its superior region the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. Levator palpebrae superioris muscle. And sometimes a person may experience an annoying twitch in the eyelid. An involuntary quivering similar to muscle twitches in the hand, forearm, legs or foot. The twitches are almost always harmless and usually last for only few seconds. They are often associated with stress and fatigue. The space between the upper and the lower eyelids that exposes the eyeball is the palpebral fissure and it angles. Its angles are known as lateral commissure which are narrower and closer to the temporal bone and the medial commissure that is broader and nearer to the 
National Home. In the medial commissure is a small reddish elevation, the lacrimal caruncle, which contains sebaceous or oil glands and pseudoferous glands, which are nothing but sped glands. And the whitish material that sometimes collects in the medial commissure comes from these glands. And from superior to deep, each eyelid consists of Epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous tissue, fibers of ocularis, oculi muscle, orbicularis, oculi muscle, a tarsal plate, tarsal glands, and conjunctiva. The tarsal plate is a thick fold of connective tissue that gives form and support to the eyelids. This is an important point. Embedded in each tarsal plate is a row of elongated modified sebaceous glands known as tarsal or mebomian glands that secrete a fluid that helps keep the eyelids from adhering to each other. So what are the glands that help the eyelids from preventing them from adhering to each other are the tarsal or Mebomian glands that secrete a fluid that helps keep the eyelids from adhering to each other. And the infection of tarsal glands produces a tumor or cyst on the eyelid called as chelation. This is also important. Infection of the tarsal glands produces a tumor or cyst on the eyelids called as chelation. And the conjunctiva is a thin protective mucous membrane composed of non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium with numerous goblet cells that supported by alveolar connective tissue. And the palpebral conjunctiva lies the inner aspect of the eyelids and the bulbular conjunctiva passes from the eyelids onto the surface of the eyeball where it covers the sclera. The white of the eye is nothing but the sclera but not the cornea, which is the transparent region that forms the outer anterior surface of the eyeball. And over the sclera, the conjunctiva is vascular. Both the sclera and the cornea will be discussed more detail shortly. And the dilation and congestion of blood vessels of the bulbular conjunctiva due to local irritation or infection are the cause for bloodshot eyes. Dilation and congestion of the blood vessels of the bulbular conjunctiva due to local infection are the cause for the bloodshot eyes. Now coming to the next accessory structure that is eyelashes and eyebrows. These are the eyelashes and this is the eyebrow. The eyelashes which project from the border of each eyelid and the eyebrows which are arch, which are transversely above the eyelids help to protect the eyeballs from foreign objects, perspiration and direct rays of sun. The sebaceous glands at the base of the hair follicles of the eyelashes called sebaceous ciliary glands release a lubricating fluid into the follicles and the infection of these glands usually by bacteria causes Painful pus filled swelling called as type. The next is the lacrimal apparatus. This is the entire anterior view of the lacrimal apparatus. The above is the lacrimal gland. Here you can see the superior lacrimal canal and this is the lacrimal sac and this thing is the lacrimal puncture, inferior lacrimal canal, nasolacrimal duct and finally this is the nostril. Coming to the function of the lacrimal gland, it produces the aqueous layer of the eye's tear film. And the aqueous layer of the tears is made up of water, proteins, vitamins, electrolytes and other substances. These substances, they help lubricate the eye, wash away debris and promise the overall eye health. Tears get to the eyes through the puncta 
and sometimes tears can be triggered by reflex tears can be produced when something gets into your eye such as a hair or any dust particle. The lacrimal apparatus is a group of structures that produce and drains lacrimal fluid and tears. And the lacrimal glands, each about the size and shape of an al almond, they secrete lacrimal fluid which drains into 6 to 12 secretory lacrimal ducts that empties tears onto the surface of the conjunctiva of the upper eyelid. And from here, the tears pass medially over the anterior surface of the eyeball to enter two small openings. To enter two small openings called as lacrimal puncta. For singular, it is punctum, lacrimal puncta. The tears then pass into two ducts, the lacrimal canals which lead into the lacrimal sac and then into the nasolacrimal duct. This duct carries the lacrimal fluid into nasal cavity just inferior to the inferior nasal conchae. And an infection of the lacrimal sacs is called as dacrocystitis. Dacro means lacrimal sac. Itis means inflammation. An inflammation or infection of the lacrimal sacs is called as dacrocystitis. And it is usually caused by bacterial infection and results in the blockage of nasolacrimal ducts. And the lacrimal glands are supplied by parasympathetic fiber of the facial nerves. Parasympathetic fibers of the facial nerves or seventh nerve. The lacrimal fluid produced by these glands is a watery solution containing of salts, some mucus and lysozyme, a protective bactericidal enzyme. And this fluid protects, cleans, lubricates and moistens the eyeball. After being secreted from the lacrimal glands, the lacrimal fluid is spread medially over the surface of the eyeball by, by the blinking of the eyelids. And each gland produces about 1 ml of lacrimal fluid per day. Normally, tears are cleared away as fast as they are produced, either by evaporation or by passing into the lacrimal canals and, done, and then into the nasal cavity. And if an irritating substance makes contact with the conjunctiva, these lacrimal glands are stimulated to over-secrete and tears accumulate. This leads to watery eyes. Lacrimation is a protective mechanism as the tears dilute and wash away the irritating substance. And the watery eyes can also occur when an inflammation of the nasal mucosa such as uh, such occurs with a cold, obstructs the nasolacrimal ducts and blocks the drainage of tears. And only humans express emotions, both happiness and sadness by crying. In response to parasympathetic stimulation, the lacrimal glands produce excessive lacrimal fluid that may spill over the edges of the eyelids and even fill the nasal cavity with the fluid. This is how crying produces a running nose because of the response of parasympathetic stimulation. Now finally coming to extrinsic eye muscles. Extrinsic eye muscles, here you can see they are lateral rectus, superior oblique and inferior oblique. This is the lateral rectus, this is the inferior rectus, inferior oblique, superior rectus and superior oblique. Lateral lectus, it rotates eyes laterally. As the name indicates, lateral lectus, it rotates eyes laterally. Superior oblique rotates eyes down and lateral. And inferior oblique rotates eyes up and lateral. The eye sits in the bony depressions of the skull called as orbits. And the orbits help protect the eyes, stabilize them in three-dimensional space and anchor them to the muscles that produce their essential moments. 
the extrinsic muscles extend from the walls of the bony orbit to the sclera of the eye and are surrounded in the orbit by significant quality quantity significant quantity of periorbital fat and these muscles are capable of moving the eyes in almost any direction six extrinsic muscles move each eye they are superior rectus inferior rectus lateral rectus medial rectus superior oblique and inferior oblique they are generally supplied by cranial nerves 3 4 and 6 or 6 in general the motor units in these muscles are small some motor neurons serve only two or three muscle fibers fewer than in any other part of the body except the larynx such small motor units permit smooth precise and rapid movements of the eyes and the extrinsic muscles move the eyeball laterally medially superiorly and inferiorly for example looking to the right requires simultaneous contraction of the right lateral rectus and left medial rectus muscles of the eyeballs and relaxation of the left lateral rectus and right medial rectus of the eyeball the oblique muscles preserve rotational stability of the eyeball oblique muscles superior oblique and the inferior oblique they preserve the rotational stability of the eyeball and neural circuits in the brain stem and cerebellum coordinate and synchronize the movements of the eye this is important the neural circuits in the brain stem brain stem and cerebellum coordinate and synchronize the movements of the eye Thank you for watching. Please subscribe for further videos on medical coding and CPC training.